at least a more benevolent contact scenario than mm-hmm. the typical uh, Gray's probing them. Uh, he he re- he remembered he and a buddy uh, rolling around like they were out. They were out in their car off off base somewhere, and all of a sudden, he remembered rolling around on the ground laughing alongside this buddy of his, um, and they never really understood why <laughs> until much later um, he was regressed, and then he uh, learned that he was brought aboard a craft and uh, met with some ETs there uh, and that kind of it was the point in his life where he started to realize what all of this amounted to that he started researching UFOs a little bit more thoroughly and got him into uh, got him out speaking about it um, he came along with Stephen Greer and uh was part of the disclosure project. Wow, that's fascinating. Pretty much. What What did he say about the ETs? Did he describe them to your group? Uh, yes, he did. And actually, I hate to say it, but I'm kind of drawing them. I don't remember exactly what his uh, encounters, the, the details of his encounters. Were they uh, similar um, to the and grace? I hate to misquote him. Yeah, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. But um, do you remember enough to say that whether or not it was like a typical gray scenario? No, it wasn't. No. And that's why I say it wasn't a typical gray scenario. Okay. They were very, uh, if anything, it would have been more like uh, Betty and Barney Hill type of contact. Okay. But um, he did not describe the beings as uh, the smaller gray types. Now... I uh, I saw that. yeah I, I saw the uh, the news clip of Franklin um, Carter uh, visiting your, your your college site there. I'm sure we we could all probably search a YouTube video for his backstory. Hey, Jason. Um, I think so. I, I'm pretty sure he's you can you can find a little, something about his backstory uh, if nothing else on the disclosure project. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Now, speaking of UFOs, you've had your own UFO encounter. I guess your whole your 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 beginnings kind of stem back. May, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you said when you were ten years old, you had a UFO experience in the Roaring Fort Valley, and that's kind of what correct. kicked you off in the direction of the paranormal. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you can you talk to us about what happened there? Um. Yeah. Because uh, it's kind of a funny story. The reaction that you had with your dad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was. Uh... It was one of those nights. Uh, we, so we lived in the Roaring Fort Valley. We had it was a an apartment building just below the highway and above the river, um, and we had this really nice picture window in the main room. Had a, a neighbor friend over for the night. And we were hanging out, and uh, we were just kind of loud, giggly little kids. Whatever. And my dad had to work the next morning. And he'd come out and told us to be quiet so we could sleep a couple times already so we decided okay all right we'll calm down and we'll just look out the window and enjoy the view beautiful mountain night the moon big in the sky and we saw all of a sudden we saw a single amber colored light come out from behind the mountain and kind of cruise across the field across the river and uh, our, we were both aviation enthusiasts, even at this young age, and we quickly recognized that this couldn't have been an airplane because it was traveling too slowly, and it only had one light, and it was the wrong color. As soon as we made that realization, it changed direction and started to zigzag across this field and came across the river. We saw the reflection of this object on the river as it came right in front of the window. Wow. At this point, I could see clearly that what it resembled to me was a five-foot or so diameter 
glass ball with an amber-colored light emanating out of the center. No machinery, no sound, no none of that. I was pretty excited, and I ran into the bedroom to tell my dad about it. Dad, Dad, you've got to come see this. And he said, shut up and go to sleep. So I said, well, okay. We wake up on Elvis and die tomorrow. It's not my fault. <laughs> I told you. Yeah. So I we came back out just in time to see this thing zip off up the river. And the parts that I didn't mention in the video was at, at this point, once we saw this zip off, I also saw there was uh, some flashing red and blue lights off on the side of the house. Now, at this point, I tried to look around thinking that there was um, thinking that maybe the police had come to try to uh, do something about this other object that we had just seen. Um, and we tried to look and see what we could see, but we really couldn't we really couldn't see anything out that way. But there were some red and blue lights on the side of the house. Hmm. They came up and kind of went away. That's strange. Um, I had always pictured in my mind that they were balls of light orbiting each other huh. of some kind, but I didn't actually physically see those. They were there briefly and went away. So next morning, my friend went home. We didn't talk about it at all. Oh, well, before we went to bed, I was still pretty excited. I was like, uh, wow, we wake up on all Sorry. And I kept saying that to myself. Zipped myself up in my sleeping bag, and I was just, like, really excited. It took me forever to get to sleep. <laughs> but I didn't want to see any more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the next day, my uh, my friend went home. We didn't talk anymore about it. Um, and then I was talking to my dad about it over breakfast. Um, and he tried to, we kind of went through the possibilities. Well, could it have been a reflection uh, on the window from across the river? Or could it have been this or that? And we weeded out all the possibilities of the usual mundane explanations. As we were discussing this over dinner, there was a huge crash and giant blocks of ice started floating down the river. Weird. And it was apparent that a, a glacier or some runoff had fallen into the river. And there was just huge, huge chunks of ice floating down the river. And this lasted for a good 10 minutes. Um, and it cleaned the river out nicely. I'd never seen anything like that before or since uh, while we had lived up there. And we lived up there for a good seven years. Hmm. Uh, but the fact that those two two events may not be connected at all, but the fact that that happened the morning after the sighting, I think was is noteworthy. Yeah, helps to uh, keep it in the memory, too. Of course, it's hard to forget something like that. Yeah. Um. So that's what. Yeah, was, so so I guess after that you had your your nose buried in in books about everything strange and weird and paranormal. Um. Yeah. And even before that, though. Oh wow. Really, <laughs> I had always been uh, in, interested, really interested in the subject. Um. An interesting thing, a friend of mine, uh, we had just been talking about in fourth, fifth grade, fifth grade, I think it was. Our school actually had a class devoted to mysteries of the universe kind of thing. Wow. It was like preparing for middle school, and we were supposed to have, like, the way I interpreted it was kind of an elective. Like, you had the opportunity to choose, like, a bird-watching or mystery class or something else. It was kind of like a free elective kind of thing. Okay. And uh, this friend of mine, who's actually still lives in the Roaring Fork Valley, and is helping me with uh, the regional study, and we're talking about starting a, a branch of the Crypto Science Society up there. Hmm. Um, but we were talking about she was in that class with me. <laughs> and uh, cool. that was one of those things that really sparked that interest uh, even more, like gave that a vehicle. And some of, some of the uh, structure of that class, actually, I took to uh, structure the meetings of the Crypto Science Society. 
Hmm. Um, so for instance, we introduce a, a topic, whether that's the Bermuda Triangle or uh, UFOs, ghosts, you name it. And uh, oh, spontaneous combustion, that was a really good um, Introduce this topic, um, maybe watch a little uh, video clip about it, introduce the information, and then have a discussion about it. And that's kind of how the Crypto Science Society meetings evolved, where it was uh, we just have take turns researching a particular topic, present on it, and then open it up for discussion. Another half of it being really focused on investigator training. So that's kind of how things evolved. And uh, things that I drew on without realizing that I had. So where, where does the, uh, the background in investigator training come from? Is this training that you've taken from MUFON and kind of uh, evolved and adapted for the, the new group? Actually, I think I have little, very little that I borrowed from MUFON. Really? Um, I feel like uh, of our investigator training from my military experience and experience in Boy Scouts than I have from anywhere else. Very basic, critical thinking, um, kind of basic skills. And I actually realized at one point that created a group of paranormal scouts, so to speak, because there's so much about um, expeditions and mission planning. You know, taking taking into account all the stuff that you you're going to need to take. So it's a lot of camping, right? Uh, a lot of um, data collecting uh, has a lot of parallels with um, you know any given activity. Um, so we have a list of a sign off list activities and tasks that you need to have completed before you can uh, go on to take the test, which is a, an oral review board, essentially, uh, that no one has failed to this point. That's because it's, it's pretty intensive. And actually, the original, uh, I've had to scale back. We've had to scale it back because the original training uh, program was far too involved for anyone to complete in a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> um, so at this point, if someone is dedicated, they can do it easily within a semester. Huh. So, so Jason, how, how does, I don't want to keep you all night, but how exactly does the process work? Like, can anyone just come up to you or any member of the Crypto Science Society and say, I'm interested? What's the orientation process? Um, pretty much. Uh, pretty much, yes. Um, there's no requirement to be an investigator, but it's part of the draw that makes everybody... Uh, I think a lot of people are interested in that aspect of it. Yeah. Um, it's We cover a topic of investigator training. It every, um, goes uh, critical thinking, uh, mission planning, um, report writing, data collection and observation. Nice. Uh, site visits. You have to uh, attend a guest speaker lecture, an approved guest speaker lecture. Um, you have to complete a research, a small research report and presentation. Um, and then uh, participate in a expedition. Sounds yeah. awesome. Um, and whether and it's basically fairly loose criteria on what all of that entails. Basically, a site visit is just where you go out and maybe interview a witness. Oh, oh there's witness interviews. Uh, one of the checks on the block. Um, but a site visit is something's been reported. You go out and check it out. Now, I haven't done uh, I haven't done extensive investigation into. Uh... Yeah, sorry. I, I, you know, just being a new member of MUFON, I haven't done extensive, uh, you know, investigation into the field investigator training, but I have done enough to recognize that already it seems like 